Good evening, everyone. Welcome here tonight. Great to be in the house of the Lord together, worshiping as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to open up the service this evening, First Chronicles, chapter 16, 28 and 29. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Powerful scripture passage. I've really appreciated the series on Joseph that just got wrapped up. Um, One thing, I'll share one thing that really stuck out to me was how Joseph reacted in every hard circumstance he went through. He took every situation and trusted God and did the best that he could everywhere he was. And it made me understand more fully that our God is a sovereign God with a purpose for everything. He is always with us in the good times and in the bad times. He is continually molding and shaping us to be more like his son. So everything that we go through has a purpose. And I'm a music pastor, so I always seem to see it through the lens of worship as well. I think God deserves our worship no matter what's going on in our lives, whether it's good things or bad things. I think we can choose to have a heart of worship, a heart that is surrendered to the will of God in our lives. So let's think of that as we... Spend time in praise and worship this evening. He deserves all the glory and he is worthy of all praise. Join us as we worship together. I choose to worship, I choose to bow, though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down, here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds, though my soul is unraveling, I choose you. fire through the storm and through the flood there is nothing that could ever steal my soul in the valley you are worthy you are good when life is not you will always and forever be my soul i build my Darkest night, it won't burn out. For you are perfect, no matter what. In the joy of the suffering, I'll sing it loud. And I will praise you through the fire.
song we could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me here, desperate. Desperate for you, I surrender.
this evening that we uh, lay our lives down before you and we surrender our will to you. God, we just want to um, deepen our relationship with you. We want to know you more and more. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that in each one of our hearts. And even as we uh, listen to a children's feature and a testimony and Pastor Gary brings your word, that you would use each one of those things to speak to our hearts and to our, our minds. We thank you for this time together. We worship you tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Am I on? Yes, I am. Okay. So last week, Mr. Weber brought a really cool motorbike. I don't have anything quite that cool, but I have chocolate. Yes. Yes, there's chocolate. So I want to talk about happiness. What makes me happy? What makes you happy? Anybody who knows me knows my love for ice cream. So if any of you would text me or say, hey, would you like to go to DQ with me and you'd buy me a blizzard? You could be guaranteed I'd, I would be happy. I love my DQ blizzard. So big hint out there for you guys. So what else makes me happy? Well, I love chocolate. That's a given. Um, I love growing flowers. Flowers make me happy. I love going on holidays. I love going out for supper. I, I like hanging out with friends. Um, yeah, those are just some of the things that make me happy. So, what makes you happy? Maybe hanging out with friends. Maybe that makes you happy too. Or maybe spending a day at the swimming pool or at the beach. Or maybe playing video games. Or maybe watching movies. Maybe that's something that really makes you happy. You know, here's something. Pastor John loves, there's a few movies he really loves. And what makes him happy is if he can watch that same movie over and over and over again. So that's something that makes him happy. Um, how about eating at McDonald's or your favorite pizza? Does that make you happy? Um, what's another one? What if you had all the money that you wanted and you could buy all the toys, the games, or clothes that you wanted. Would that make you happy? Well, these are all just some ideas, but oh, I would like to share my chocolate with you. Now, that's not something you'll hear me say very often, but tonight I'm feeling happy, and I would like to share my chocolate with the kids, just with the kids. So, if the kids can tell me what makes them happy. You can either yell it out from where you are or come on up, tell me what makes you happy. You can come grab two chocolate bars. But I need to hear, what makes you happy? Perfect, come on up. Emery, come get some chocolate bars. Anybody else? Perfect, come on up. You can yell it out, just come on up and grab some chocolate if you can tell me what makes you happy. Oh, yes. Perfect. Ella, what makes you happy? Your sticker book? Yes. Come on up, Zeke. Ah, yeah, that counts. That's perfect. Come on up. Anybody else? We've got a few more kids out there. Thomas and Anna, why don't you come grab some chocolate bars? I bet I know what makes you happy, but you can come grab some chocolate bars. You can each have two. Do you guys want some chocolate bars? Does chocolate make you happy? Me too. Go ahead, grab some chocolate bars. You can each have two. I'm glad you guys like the Smarties, because that's usually the one that stays in the box the longest. 
There you go. Anybody else? Did I miss any kids? Oh, yes. Come on up. Okay. Last call. Everybody got some that? Well, no, not everybody. Just the kids? We're good? Okay. So, um, lots of things make us happy, but do they keep you happy? Do they fill you with joy? Once you're done those chocolate bars, do you think you'll still be happy? Maybe, right? But do they keep you happy? Do they fill you with joy? Because sometimes you're, you're having a great day, you're happy because you get to play video games all afternoon, and then your parents say, you know what? It's time to turn that TV off. It's time to do some chores. Well, pff, then I'm not happy anymore, right? Or maybe it's time to go to bed. Then I'm not happy. Or maybe your friend just doesn't want to play with you. Yeah, and then that's, you don't feel so happy either, right? Or how about having to go back to school? That's only about a week and a half away, right? And you know what? Maybe you're happy about that, and that's great, but not always. So what keeps us happy or joyful? If I ask my kids in Sunday school, who can keep us happy all the time? What would your answer be? Who can keep us happy? Yes, Emery, you're right. Jesus can keep us happy. And that's exactly what we have to learn. Jesus loves to be our friend, and we all like having a friend, right? Jesus can be our best friend. He's there for us when we're sad, when we're lonely, when we're angry, or even when we're happy. So different things we can do, we can read our Bible, or you can have your mom and dad read Bible stories to you. If you like listening to songs that worship Jesus, or you could just talk to him, pray to him, right? Those are all different ways that we can connect with Jesus, and we can feel that he is with us. He can calm us when we're worried or afraid. Some of you might be anxious about going back to school, and you're not quite sure what that might look like, because this school year could be different. But you know what? Just tell Jesus that. And he'll calm you. And he, he knows what you're feeling, and he wants to be there for you. He promises to be there with us. So he is a friend that keeps us happy. And he fills us with joy when we let him to be a part of our everyday life. I love what this last verse tells us. Psalm 28, verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. That's a great Bible verse. Um, I hope this will be just a good reminder of how Jesus can keep you happy and joyful. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joelle Weeb, and this coming year I have the opportunity to go to Russell, Manitoba for my fourth year internship with Miller College of the Bible. I will be serving with Youth for Christ and with the Russell Alliance Church there. During the course of the year, I will travel back to Miller Pambrin campus seven times for module week classes, and the rest of my time will be spent at Russell for my internship. In Russell, I will be largely involved in youth ministries, both with Youth for Christ and also with the church. With Youth for Christ, I'll be involved in their after-school program, which includes hanging out with the youth, having supper together, and also having a Bible study after that. I'll also be involved in helping plan some fundraisers that they do for Youth for Christ, and the branch in Russell is also planning on being in the new building this fall. With the Russell Alliance Church, I will be helping with their youth program as well as some music stuff and wherever else they decide to put me once I get there. I'll also be mentoring some of the youth girls, both from Youth for Christ and the church, and I hope to use this as an opportunity to encourage them in their walks with Christ. My internship in Russell is unique because it's split between these two different organizations, though the two are quite connected as a lot of the staff from Youth for Christ also attend the Alliance Church. And so through Youth for Christ, I am required to raise support for my monthly stipend of $500.
and the Alliance Church is providing me with room and board with a billet family that attends the church. I'm super excited to go and get a taste of what ministry looks like in this capacity. I'm excited to see how God will use me and how he will grow me throughout the year. God has grown me so much in my love for him these last three years at Miller, and I know that he'll continue to do so in my fourth year as well. Philippians 1.6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I am excited to see this play out in my own life and also in the lives of the youth that I will be interacting with, both at Youth for Christ and at the church in Russell. I am excited to see how God will work in their lives and I hope to see them grow also in their love for the Lord. God is so good and faithful and I know that he goes with me on this new adventure. He is at work in so many amazing ways and I can't wait to see what that will look like this year. Um, please pray that God will use me to further his kingdom and show Christ's love to those around me. I would also appreciate prayer for this time of transition as I move provinces and as I will be living with a couple from the church in Russell. Pray that I will shine God's light to all that I see. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing of your plans for the coming year, Joel. And uh, I'd just like to pray with you as you will be heading off already before this video airs, before we do this, she will already be in Miller and probably actually the weekend we, we we're going to play this, she will actually probably be on her way to Russell. And so I uh, just want to pray with you as you, uh, your week leading up, as you pack everything for the next little while, the next part of your life. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Joelle and I thank you, Lord God, how you have been working in her life uh, this past three years as she's gone to Bible college and how you have molded her and, and shaped her during this time and how you continue to mold her and shape you. And so thank you for this opportunity that she has to uh, go to her fourth year. And uh, thank you, God, that she has uh, an incredible opportunity to um, just experience some, some incredible ministry opportunities. And so, Father, we just pray that you would just... Um, as she prepares even this coming week, as she prepares to go, that you would just be with her, pray that there would be a calmness and a peace, and, and pray that you just give her clarity of what she needs to bring and, and uh, all, of those, all of those things that need to fall in place this, this next week, God, that you would just uh, guide her and direct her in that, and I pray that she would have a peace and a calmness, and pray for safety as she travels to Miller, first of all, and spends a week there and then on to Russell and pray for safety as she travels, pray for uh, a, the vehicle to work well. And, and I pray too, as she uh, enters this, this new venture in her life, that you would just uh, help her to make friends and make good contacts and, and that you'd be able, to, be able to build relationships in, in a short time. So Father, we pray for this transition time, uh, that you would be with her, that you would give her boldness, um, that you would give her strength, and all through all of this, that you would give her joy. And Father, as she begins to serve and working with youth, that you would just give her uh, strength and, and courage and uh, the ability uh, to interact with youth in a, in a meaningful way. And so God, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you that she is willing to serve and, and to see what you have in store for her for her the rest of her life. But in this year, in this coming year, that it would be just a, a beneficial time for her to uh, grow in her faith as well as uh, help those teenagers uh, to grow in their faith as, as well and to be able to come alongside them and, and just to mentor them, disciple them. What a, what a privilege and opportunity. So God, again, we just thank you for this opportunity that Joelle has and uh, we thank you that you are going with her. And so we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So thank you very much. The Lord bless you as you uh, head out to uh, Miller and then on to Russell, Manitoba. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday night service. What a, what a joy and a privilege to again come to church, to be able to worship, to be able to fellowship. And uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a real joy to be here on a, on a Saturday night. I appreciate it. Uh, Joelle is well on her way to uh, Russell, I'm sure. And uh, part of my story is, is uh, the, the My Story segment is where that fits in. And so uh, just, a, just a great time. Uh, that she will experience uh, coming up. 
Lots of people are going back to school uh, in the next little while, whether it's Bible college, university, or uh, any, any type of school at all, and um, everything is different. Uh, talking to some university students this past week, and it'll be online. And, and of course, we know that the public school system or, and even some of the, some of the, the, the private school systems uh, are changing drastically, and uh, so, so lots of things look very differently. Let's just pray for the students as they head back this week or in the coming uh, weeks. Heavenly Father, you are a God who loves us. You are a God who cares us. You are a God who is not surprised by all of these changes. And so, God, it's uh, in you that we trust. And as students go back and contemplate going back or possibly homeschooling uh, for the first time or maybe just continuing to homeschool or going to universities, I just pray, Lord God, that you would just uh, be with them, that they would be encouraged, and that they would experience the joy of the Lord uh, in light of just different times. I pray that they wouldn't be discouraged, uh, but that this would uh, be a, just an incredible opportunity. So God, we just pray that you would go with the students and be with the teachers as things have tra- changed drastically for them as well. And, and even their uh, desire, passion to teach, that it would still be there in light of uh, so many changes. So God, we thank you for all of our students. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Again, thank you and, and for coming to worship Today, it's, it's uh, online, we're glad that you're joining us as well, and um, we look forward to what God has for us through the rest of the service. Pastor Vern, if you and I had con- been in contact this week about my sermon, which we didn't do, you would have been bang on, and you still bang on, but uh, we give all the glory to God because he picked the songs, and uh, Diane... Um, like everything is just, you know, God is in it, and, and it's just going to be a fantastic service as, as we carry on, as you see how God is in, in all of these things. So just a couple of things that I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about. So typically, uh, this time of year, we're at the end of August. Typically, this time of year, we're waiting for collect, Connect Bible classes to, to kick off uh, the week after the long weekend. This year, that date's going to be pushed back a little bit as we try to develop um, possibly some options or some plans um, that would be feasible and sustainable to run in light of our current restrictions. And so that's something that's being worked on. Uh, Pastor Dan has sent an email out to parents, and and I don't know if everybody is on that email list or not, or if emails have changed. Um, but if you have some thoughts and ideas where you're at, uh, is it a good idea, is it a bad idea, what are some of the options that we could look at, please get in touch with Pastor Dan in regards to that uh, as well. One of the things that we, we really need to, to remember is that Connect will look different. I don't know what it'll look like, it will look different, but it does, just because it's different doesn't mean that it will be bad or ineffective, and so just remember that as we go along. And uh, so support us in your prayers, uh, prayerfully support us in that. It, it's an important time, part of our church life. Uh, we, adults appreciate this time so much as well, and so we will, we will just trust that God will provide uh, wisdom in all of that. Secondly, life, group, life groups should be launching mid-September uh, for anyone interested in becoming part of a community uh, rather than just being uh, someone who sits in, in a pew and, and nobody knows your name. And we want you people to know your name. We want you to be part of the community. And so uh, we will be starting kicking off life groups in mid-September. So we're still working on that as well, but uh, we're, we're working hard. We're pushing hard to get those, those going and, and in place. Uh, so that's all I want to talk about this morning in, in light of that. Somebody reminded me, well, and, 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 and I, I'm well aware of it, um, it's been a while since I've preached. It's been, in fact, I looked at my calendar today uh, just before I came up here, and it's, it's six weeks, actually, six weeks ago that I preached last. A couple of those were holidays, and then a couple of them, I guess I was just a bit of a slacker and let the other guys take over, so it worked out well. But it's, it's good, and I was thinking about it, but I'm, I, I was nervous, I, you know, and uh, I typically get a little bit nervous every time I speak. But today it's just amped up a little bit, and so uh, my hand, I was uh, in the back in the lobby for a bit, and my hand was just a shaking. Dan figured it was from too much coffee. I would think, think it was from a lack of coffee, but who knows, who knows. Um, 
So let's just get into the sermon, otherwise you're going to be here, here late and you're not going to be happy with me. Well, a young man was delighted to, you know, he wasn't, uh, wasn't very familiar with, with the farm life, and so he was quite delighted to see uh, a donkey as he visited a local farm. He had the opportunity to visit a local farm, and so he was just staring at the, at the, the donkey for the longest time, and finally he remarks to the, to the owner, to the farmer, he said, man, that donkey must be a Christian. The farmer asked, why would you say that? Oh, he's got such a long face. Ouch! Ouch! I've heard that a couple of times in a couple of different books that I've read. I've, I've heard this illustration. Now, in a way, it's a little bit funny, but in a way, it's actually really sad. In 2018... Yale University offered a class entitled Psychology and the Good Life. It was the largest class in the university's 316-year history. 1,200 students enrolled in the class. Nearly one quarter of the entire student body enrolled in that class. Why would the most gifted students with seemingly so much potential, flock to a class, to take a class on personal happiness. We would consider these people the ones who are, you know, they've got it all. But they're flocking to a class on personal happiness. I think happiness is often like the pot of gold we see that at the end of the rainbow, and, or, or you know, if you, you, you uh, tie a, uh, uh, something to, you, you know, you, if you put a, tie a, a stick onto the front of me and, and put a, a donut in front of me or something like that, and it, you know, it's always out of reach and you keep moving forward, but it's just always out of reach. And that's the way I believe people have, have, have come. They've come to the point where happiness just seems a little bit out of reach. It's always just the next step, like we can grab onto it. The next thing will bring us happiness. It's just out of reach. Most people search all their lives for happiness. Diane showed a lot of things that make, make people happy. Unfortunately, that chocolate bar, when it comes to the end, that last bite, it's, it does bring us happiness, but now it's gone. Now what? to the next one and so we want the next thing but we're searching for happiness in uh, friends in family in um, work career social standing education travel wealth luxury marriage having children property or a, a home we feel that once we have that certain thing we will have achieved happiness. We've got it. Happiness also is not only found in the extreme or the expensive, because we can search for happiness in modest but comfortable life as well. A lot of us pursue happiness at the expense of Family, time, energy, our resources, there's a cost involved. And then reaching what we perceive to bring that happiness often leaves us unfulfilled. We've reached that pinnacle, that high point. And yet it hasn't brought us lasting joy. Again, we become anxious and unhappy not knowing what went wrong. This should have brought me happiness. I'm here now. Why am I not happy? Several years ago, I was watching uh, TV with one of my kids, and uh, a commercial came on, and it was advertising a, a, a certain toy. I, I have no idea what it was. But as, as they were, you know, as, as they do on commercials and advertisements, they make this thing look extremely fun 
And, and one of my kids asked me, they said, Dad, why do they make it look so much fun on, on TV, and yet when we get it home, it's just not that fun? You see, that's the same principle. They're, they're advertising happiness that this is it. Because they're using all kinds of effects and they're using other things that, that maybe will make that toy more fun or, uh, of course, they're using uh, you know, different f- effects that will make it look more fun as well. But in reality, it just simply doesn't quite meet all those expectations. It misses the mark. Now what? When you've come to this place, now what? In fact, the search for happiness, for joy in our lives, for that ultimate, you know, what that thing that is going to make us complete, we we, it can leave us drained. It can tire us out. It can consume all of our energy. It's exhausting, and ultimately can be extremely unsatisfying. Maybe your search for happiness has left you feeling. Like the teacher in Ecclesiastes. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He goes on to spell, as as you you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, he goes on to, to spell out where he's been searching, and he's been looking, the teacher here, he's been looking for happiness in wealth, in, in, in work, in other things, accumulating stuff, and he has lots of things, and he's pursuing these things for happiness. He devotes himself to study, because wisdom will bring him happiness. He devotes himself to work because work will bring him happiness, possibly through wealth. He enjoyed an incredible lifestyle. And this is the guy that's, that's coming up with this, this saying. This is the teacher saying, meaningless. It is utterly meaningless. I've searched here and it's utterly meaningless. I remember reading Ecclesiastes sometime in my 20s and... What, it, what hit me so hard at that time was, it was like I was expressing my own feelings. Because I was at that same point, searching for happiness, winding up in, the, in that place of it's meaningless. I'm searching so hard and, and putting so much effort into being happy or what is perceived to make me happy, that I, and, and all of a sudden I, I find myself empty Because I was searching for joy in empty objects that were never designed or created to bring us that joy and fulfillment that we're looking for. And again, you come to the place. Where you think this will make you happy. Now I have it all. And it failed. I got to the point where I was. I asked my dad one day. I said, Dad, you've been working for X amount of years at that point in his life. How do you do it? How do you continue to do it? How do, you, how do you get up every morning and you go to work and you, and you come home at the end of the day, you go to sleep and you do it all over again? And at that point, I was looking like at 40 to 50 years more of this. That was pretty daunting for me because I wasn't happy at all and I was searching for it in all the wrong things and so then it made me extremely, extremely sad and unhappy. On Monday, when I would go to work, I would religiously, it started on Monday already, I would religiously look for Friday. It's coming, it's coming. Only four more days, only three more, only two more days. Oh my goodness, there's still another day to go. Till Friday, when Friday reached, 
It was great for, there was happiness for a short period of time. By Sunday morning or even Saturday night, I was thinking, oh my goodness, tomorrow, there's only tomorrow and then I got to go back to work on Monday. It sucks the joy right out of me. This is where I was. There was no happiness. There was no contentment. There was no purpose. Can you imagine if, if that, when you're looking at that, I don't mean to depress you, but can you imagine if that was it, that's all there is to the sermon? What a horrible place to stay. Throughout Ecclesiastes, the teacher has investigated the situation of mankind and he concludes by acknowledging that the whole of humanity consists not in its mortality or ignorance, but in its dependence upon God. It's dependence on God that brings, brings true, lasting joy that leads to fulfillment that doesn't leave you longing for and dreading every single day, unhappy because of where you are. The teacher in Ecclesiastes experienced wisdom, wealth, but found that in and of themselves they didn't provide worth. Too often we seek our ultimate enjoyment in created things rather than in the creator. Isn't it a big ask to ask a created thing to bring you joy and fulfillment. If I were to, you know, and we get to that place, right? I want the, the new iPad because it's going to make me happy because it can do so many things that there's going to be joy. I'm going to feel complete now because I got this new iPad. It's the object of, and it'll bring me joy and happiness. Oh my goodness. Somebody was laughing at me because that's how ridiculous it was. That's the appropriate response. That object cannot bring me that kind of joy and fulfillment. We're asking too much because this was, well, maybe Apple is designing it to bring us joy and excitement or joy and happiness, but it falls short. I know it falls short. But that's the way I get you get a new computer, you get a, the new car. Oh, happiness. It brings me fulfillment for a while. Why are we doing that? We are asking way too much of an object, asking something of it that it cannot provide, asking it to fulfill a need that was, not, that, that was created by God that he can only fill it can't be filled by some crazy object. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. meaningless. Augustine, Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. That restlessness, that longing, comes from God having set eternity in our hearts. You find that in Ecclesiastes 3.11. This means that no moment of time, no finite pleasure is enough to satisfy our longing for the eternal. And in light of that, nothing else will do. Nothing will fill that void. Nothing will fill that e emptiness that was designed for uh, eternity, for a relationship with God himself. Now, wisdom and hard work, these are fruits of our labor and they are gifts of, from God. They're gifts that God has given us for mankind to enjoy. But to enjoy these gifts, we have to have our loves of these gifts or even of God in the right order. They have to be in the right order. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, 2, 8 reminds us that we live in a fallen world and 
and we're not immune to the results of that fall. And so different things happen to us. Time, uh, there's a different time, a different season for everything as well. We have to know that and understand that. But if joy and happiness are only found in the things that we have no control of and, and pass with time, joy and happiness will elude us forever. Created things become corrupted or meaningless only when we pursue them in place of God. So in and of themselves, these things are not wrong, but they become wrong, they become idols, in fact, when we pursue them over God, when they take the place of God in our lives. The teacher concludes in, in, in Ecclesiastes 13, uh, sorry, 12, uh, 13 to 14, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified because I like the, the language that the Amplified, the descriptive language that the Amplified uses. And in case you're wondering, why do I keep referring to, in Ecclesiastes, the author to the teacher? Typically, a lot of people will assume that it's Solomon that wrote it. And as I was reading, and, and I didn't have enough time to thoroughly read and conclude on my own, some people have questioned whether or not uh, Solomon is in fact the author. And so I'm just referring to him as the teacher. I haven't set my place to what I believe because I haven't had the time. Typically, I have, have, have uh, sided with the aspect that Solomon is the author, and I would just have to do more study. That's why I'm referring to the author as the teacher, in case you're wondering. I know Wes might be wondering. Uh, maybe not. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. So all has been heard. It's like a, it's like a court. I brought all the evidence out before you. All has been heard. The end of the matter is... This is the conclusion of all of this. Fear God. Revere and worship Him knowing that He is. And a parenthesis there. Knowing that He is. Boom. And then it goes on. And keep His commandments for this is the whole of man. The full original purpose of His creation. The object of God's providence. The root of character, the foundation of all happiness. The adjustment to all inharmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun and the whole duty for every man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or evil. The sum, that's the sum total of his journey to find the meaning of life. It's about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. We exist for God to bring glory to his name. Let's look at, let's look to what I believe is a New Testament example of what we've been talking about here. Uh, Paul has found the secret as he's been searching We've been going through Solomon, and, and Solomon was searching for happiness and all of these things, but I believe Paul has found exactly what leads to happiness. Philippians 4, 12 to 13 says this in the New Living Translation. I know how to live on, most, uh, on almost nothing or with everything. So here's a guy who's been on both sides of whether he's had lots or he has had little. So I think that's a good source to go to. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. The Apostle Paul's life experience has been broad. He's experienced comfort. He's experienced poverty and little. And he says, I've learned the secret. What is the secret, Paul? Tell us what the secret is. Everybody in this world is searching, including believers, is searching for happiness. They want to be happy. They want to be fulfilled. And probably a better term, and I'll talk a little, I think I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later on, the definition of joy and what that is. But Paul, please tell us what it is. What is the secret? And your last song, Pastor Vern, sums it up well. Surrender. 
Surrender to Christ, and through Christ, I can do everything because he gives me strength. Here it is. I'm going to read Philippians 3, 8 to 11. Here it is. This is what Paul has landed on. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's it. Everything else is a loss. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Here, Christ is everything. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul's got the answer. Not knowing about him, but knowing him, Jesus, personally. Paul understood that all of his self-efforts left him to be this self-righteous guy, but they did nothing for his spiritual well-being. For those of you who like money and numbers, you can look at it this way. His spiritual bank account, so to speak, was in the, in the red. It was big-time negative. How could he repay by his own works? He couldn't. Everything he had done until this point, all of the, man, this guy, and he talks about it in this passage in, in Philippians here, he talks about it, just what he did, the accomplishments that he had. He was, if anybody talked about, I have done things and stuff, it was him. But all of those, or sorry, none of those did anything to his spiritual bank account dealing with any of the sin in his life. After he had done all, uh, done, uh, after he had done all by keeping the laws and killing those who weren't obeying, obeying those laws, he still had nothing. This guy was zealous. He did what he thought was right and he did it so well, but it did nothing for his spiritual well-being until he realized that Christ, his account is perfect. And so Paul trusted in Christ. When Paul, by faith, trusted Christ, God applied Christ's righteousness to his account. Paul recognized that all of his efforts would never apply to, his, to the sin on his account. All of his sins had, however, been put on Christ's account. And Christ dealt with him on the cross. When he by faith believed. That's an amazing place to come to that understanding that everything that I do is going to amount to absolutely nothing in light of my sin and the reconciliation that I need before God himself. So to understand that, to know that, to get to that place, that's an amazing knowledge of God's grace. And then on top of that, to realize that that debt, that sin debt, would never, ever be applied to his account ever again. Christ had dealt with it. Paul was willing to receive the free gift of the righteousness of Christ. Paul's conversion wasn't the end but it was the beginning of relationship. It was the end of his old life, the death of the self-life, the death of the, 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 the life that he lived. But it was the, and, and it was the beginning of his new life. But there was more. It's ongoing. It doesn't just start. 
His life was completely transformed by Christ. Verse 8 in Philippians says this, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That's relationship there. But it's more than relationship. He is also my master. That's the relationship that he's also building and coming into. Look at verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. I want to know Christ intimately. Not just know of him, not just know about him, not just know some of the good things that he can can do, but I want to experience them personally. That's what Paul's saying them. I want that relationship to be so deep that I want to experience everything that Christ is. And so Paul walked with Christ. He he prayed with Christ. He he obeyed, he, sorry, he prayed, he obeyed his will, and he sir, and he and he sought to glorify his. His name. When he was living under law, all Paul had was these set of rules, these set of laws. And man, he kept them to the letter of those laws. Man, he was (laughs) religious. He kept them religiously. Yeah, absolutely. But he kept them like nobody else could keep them. But did it bring him happiness? Did it bring him joy and satisfaction? No. In his relationship with Christ, now he found a friend. He found a master, a constant companion. Well, you might think, yeah, well, Paul didn't have as have it as hard as I do. Excuse me? You know where he's writing this? letter to the Philippian church. He's in jail. And it's not a nice jail with four walls and maybe some bars you can rattle a pin across the front. It's like a manhole in the road. You open up a manhole and you put all these people down there. And they're not very big. It's a round concrete hole in the ground. And after it gets a certain uh, too full, They take and they flood it with water to clean the people out. That's where he is. That's where he's writing this. This dude was in prison when he writes about the joy in his life. Paul knew that it was a privilege to suffer for Christ. In fact, suffering had been a part of his experience from his conversion in Acts. But it was worth it. What Paul gained when he became a follower of Jesus, and he talks about that, it surpassed anything that he used to consider good before his life was transformed by Jesus. He considered, in fact, he considered everything, including the suffering, when he was suffering, he considered that to be okay, and he considered it to be good. In fact, everything else was like cow dung. Everything else was like garbage to him. Because now he had purpose, now he had meaning, and now he had joy in his life. That, that void of eternity that, that is put into mankind was filled with the person of Jesus Christ. He had joy because his life did not be, depend on some cheap thing or electronic device that will go dead in a matter of time. They rather depended on the eternal values found in Christ. People that are living for things are never really happy because they're constantly trying to protect their things. It might depreciate. It might get broken. They're constantly having to protect their treasures. The spiritual-minded believer has treasure in Christ that can never be taken away nor lose value. That's why Paul could so easily express 
the joy he was feeling in light of being in prison, in light of being in jail. He made a choice to rejoice based on his newfound freedom in Christ. He was now debt free. And he encouraged the believers in Philippi to rejoice because he says, he says in, in, in chapter four, I think it is, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is near. He is near and you, have, and you don't have to be anxious about anything. You can bring your cares and worries to God. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The word rejoice here refers to a lifestyle of joy, not a moment of joy that, that an ice cream cone or a chocolate bar or a, an iPad or some other thing can, can give you. It's a lifestyle that is brought about by an intentional choice to be joyful regardless of circumstances. It describes a physical change in your body language, in your facial expression, in your conversation. There is no more long donkey face. That might not sound good. Um, but but that, 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 that long expression that the believer has is gone because they're filled with joy. That doesn't mean we're smiling all the time, but there is joy in our hearts. Proverbs 15, 13 describes this well. It says, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. When you see someone whose spirit is absolutely crushed, you can tell because their whole demeanor is different. They're walking around different. When I was in my 20s and experiencing uh, uh, this, this unhappiness in my life and looking for joy, the, the, my demeanor was different. It was, there was no joy. There was no, you know, the head held high. There was doom and gloom. There is, it affects every part of who you are. You can't fake this. This type of joy you can't fake. There's a physical expression of joy, something that radiates you from, uh, to, to those around you. Even in hardship, people can see that. Paul intentionally made the choice to rejoice even when he was in jail, even when he was being persecuted, mistreated, suffering for Christ. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, you know, that grit your teeth and kind of uh, hunker down and we're going to get through this and I'm going to smile through this pain. That's not what it was. This was authentic. It was supernatural joy. Evidence of his spirit-filled life living out the fruit of the spirit. And this is the only way that I found happiness and joy. By starting to understand this, I still worked, but there began to be purpose and meaning in my life that brought joy to my life when I committed and surrendered my life completely to follow Christ. It changed from a work of, uh, of going to work as something so dreadful that it became a, a joy that it was a gift to have the ability to go to work, to earn money, to raise a family support a family, and then on top of that to enjoy blessings because God over the years has been abundant at times in his provision to us. I can't imagine where I would be if I wouldn't have surrendered to Christ and sought happiness in him. And I surrender, I have to surrender each day because when I don't, I know exactly what happened in my life. As a disciple of Jesus, are you, experience, are you experiencing the joy of the Lord in your life? I trust many of us are. But there may be some who are discouraged. Maybe you're echoing the very words of Ecclesiastes. It's meaningless. This life is meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Or maybe you're not a child of God at this point. And that's where you find yourself today. 
want to experience joy in your life? I think I know the, the answer to that question. But what changes? If you want to experience this kind of joy that Paul experienced in your life, what kind of changes are you going to have to make in your life? To experience that kind of joy. Are you willing to make those changes? Are you willing to make the choice to rejoice no matter the circumstance? My choice to rejoice is an expression. I am Christ's possession. I want to wrap up just by reading reading this um, Philippians 3, 8 to 11 in the Amplified today. If you're you have your Bible with you and, and you have it in the Amplified, great. If not, close your eyes and listen to this. Think hard, but Dan, don't fall asleep. I said, close your eyes, but don't fall asleep. And, sorry, Dan. And when, when you're, is this me? Consider the language that's being here. Is this me or is this, I want this to be me. I want this in my life. Let's read. Close your eyes with me. Actually, I won't because I'm reading Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him. That's my prayer for my life. God, I want to know the surpassing worth and the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively coming more deeply and intimately acquainted with You. God, for your sake, I have lost everything and consider it to be mere rubbish. God, I want, to, I want this to be my prayer that I consider it pure rubbish. Refuge. The dredges. In order that I may win and gain Christ the Anointed One and that I may actually be found and known as in Him, not having self-achieved righteousness, that can be called my own based on my obedience to the law's demands, ritualistic uprightness and supposed right standing with God thus acquired, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ the Anointed One. The truly right standing with God which comes from God by saving faith. For my, de my determined purpose is that I may know Him. Pray that with me. God, that I may know You, that I may progressively become more deeply acquainted with You. Perceiving and understanding the wonders of Your person more strongly and clearly, and that I may in that same way Come to know your power overflowing from your resurrection which exerts itself over me as a believer and that I may share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into likeness even to his death in the hope that if possible I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while in the body. Oh God, 
that I would fix my eyes on you. God, that I may surrender all that I hold dear that is not you. Father, give me through your Holy Spirit the power and the strength to surrender those things, those objects that I've placed before you. May I surrender my will that your will may be accomplished. Father, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, and the, and the Lord bless you as you go throughout your week and enjoy the rest of the weekend. You're dismissed.